Well, in this session, we're going to be exploring system modeling. Now, this forms part of our next unit, which is exploring systems engineering research and ways of developing dynamic system models that we can use to analyze education organizations. As you know, you're going to be using that for your second assessment item. And through this, we're going to explore how research informed processes um, can help us in developing educational transformation approaches. Basically, how we can better ensure that the educational technology initiative that you wish to put into place into your educational organization will be more successful through using research to help us. And systems modeling is one of the approaches we're using to do that. So in this week, we're going to be exploring system modeling techniques in some more detail. And in particular, the use of storytelling through system models to better understand and explain complex systems. So in the tutorial this week, you should come along prepared to discuss your understanding of system models and how we can use research to better explore those systems and explain the complex dynamic involvements occurring within the systems, particularly as they're going to relate to the system that you're investigating for your transformation plan. Now, there's a little video clip to watch to explore in some more detail about systems thinking. Um, so have a look at that. And then we've got a number of readings for you to go into a little bit more detail about some specifics. Now, the first of these, Systems Modeling Theory and Practice, I want you to just look at Chapter 2. And in particular, it explores three perspectives of um, systems modeling. Those that have a rationalist perspective, which is the more traditional approach to managing an organization. Um, those that have an evolutionist perspective, where the organization evolves as a result of various factors. And then what's called a proceduralist perspective, which is really taking on board the systems thinking approach, the systems modeling approach, and how that can afford various ways of managing an organization. And in your case, you're going to be managing the introduction of an educational technology into an organization. Um, and how systems thinking can assist with that process. So read through the chapter and note down some questions to ask during the tutorial. Of course, remember, these are stimulus for our discussions in the tutorials. Or if you're unable to attend the tutorial, then contribute to the online forum in Teams so that we can engage with these concepts in more detail. Now, the second reading is um, looking at um, systems models in terms of their capabilities, and in particular, looking at their ability to help us when we want to overcome the inertia within an organization. A fair bit of our initial modeling was around developing the socio-ecological model of um, influence factors, factors that would influence various stakeholders to support your um, intervention or not. That systems modeling can also be taken further in examining that, examining those influence factors and identifying the organizational inertia that is going to resist change and the various factors and influences that we can apply to that to help promote change within an organization. So have a look at, at that reading again through the lens of your um, transformation plan and this organizational system that you're exploring through systems modeling and how we can better understand some of the factors that are going to need to be um, influenced in order to affect uh, the transformation that you want to see happen within that organization. Okay, so let's look at some more systems models and see how we can um, use the various modeling techniques to better understand what's happening within the system and how we can influence what's occurring within that system. 
So this week we're going into a bit more detail using stock and flow diagrams and building up models using the techniques that we explored in the last session. So the first model um, shows a learning environment and the various interactions that can be occurring, positive and negative, that affect various stocks within that, this particular system. So here we have the learning system in the center, which could be something like the learning management system. And there are various interacting elements. Um, in this system, they were doing project work. So that was a relatively important um, subsystem within the overall system. There was the course readings, which formed a subsystem informing how students learnt about various concepts within the learning system. It was also looking at students sleep patterns and how much time they had to devote for doing various learning activities. And then looking at all the various interactions that were occurring. And some of them were reinforcing and some of them were balancing and, and identifying those causal loops that come into play when we examine um, systems. So that's just one example. But we use these examples to tell stories, to try to explain what's occurring within an organization. Um, and that's their real power. They are a useful simulation model in themselves, but their ability to help us tell stories and have those stories supported by some level of evidence so that we can make more assertive um, conclusions based upon the stories rather than just based upon predictions and other um, aspects of research. So this next model is called the bird, fleet, bird feeders dilemma, where someone wants to increase the number of birds coming into their garden. Um, and to do so, they introduce a bird feeder. <laughs> so, whoops. Let's have a look at that as an interaction. So this particular little interaction allows us to step through the processes um, occurring in the simulation um, where someone notices that having birds outside when they're eating their breakfast on their patio what made it a more pleasant environment. So to encourage more birds, they decided to introduce a bird feeder, um, which increased the number of birds and it made things more and more pleasant. All well and good so far. It also increased the attractiveness of the garden, which also made it even more pleasant. Um, and by making it more attractive, it increased the number of birds coming to the garden as well. But there are also some other consequences. Um, well, first off, having a pleasant morning helped reduce our frustration levels, which was good. Um, and that made it even more pleasant for us. But we also needed to then buy more bird seed. which led to more frustration because we had to spend money, had to take time out going and buying birdseed. So it wasn't all positive. Now there was also some spillage as well. As more and more birds came to the bird feeder, they would spill more and more birdseed, which meant we had to go and buy more and more birdseed, which increased our frustration levels. And bird feeders also attracted squirrels. Well, this is a US model, let's say um, attracting mice which decreased the number of birds coming to the bird feeder and also increased the amount of spillage, which meant we had to buy more and more bird seed, which increased our frustration. And it attracted more and more rodents, which increased our frustration even more. So not just mice, but also rats. Um, and led to unsightly growth from all the spillage. So all the spilled bird seed started sprouting um, growth. Uh, making it more unsightly. And the birds were also pooing, which made more frustrations. So 
even though we had a lot of positives, there were a number of negatives that came about through examining the system in more and more detail. Relatively simple system, but eventually there may be so much frustration caused that it would overcome any benefit to having a pleasant morning because we hadn't necessarily considered all the other interactions that could be occurring as a result of the initiative that we're putting in place. In this case, installing a bird feeder. So another, oops. Another example used with young children is teaching them more about learning about making friends and learning how to make friends. Um, and the fact that we make friends and we lose friends, and that's just a natural part of life. Um, but there are things that we can understand about friendship by looking at systems models. Um, so in this case, we can build more complex models about making friends. There's a total number of uh, children around that we can make friends from. Um, some of them will already have friends. Some of them will be looking for friends. Um, having more friends means you're more likely to make more friends. Um, but if you've only got a couple of friends, then it's harder. So these are things that are helpful to understand by looking at systems models. And there's a little video clip for you to look at um, that shows some children going through the process of exploring systems modeling um, to understand friendships. Um, and this is just a little reinforcement and balancing model about making friends and losing friends. We're making more, if we make more and more friends, we tend to get more and more friends. And so that's a balancing, sorry, a reinforcing loop where it's a, a continuously increasing. But losing friends will often be balancing. As we lose friends, we might then make some new friends and we might lose some friends and it will tend to oscillate. So there may be different ways of exploring and understanding what's happening with friendships by looking at those processes. And then we can look at how it can impact upon social interactions, such as if we use mean words to our friends, that may result in hurt feelings. Um, and there can be various interactions and effects that we can explore as a result of that. So have a look at the little video clip that will just look at how young children can explore relatively complex systems through the use of systems modeling. And then we can build those into simulations. Let's have a look at this one. Which takes us through um, friendships in a bit more detail. So there are a range of possible decisions that can be made um, around making friends and losing friends and so forth. And if we start with the first one, we might try to try to make six new friends a week. Or if we've got a class of 30, how many friends are we going to try to make in that class? Let's say we're going to try to make six friends. Um, and if we make one friend, we'll make a friend or if we might we might make two friends when we make a friend because that friend may also have friends that become our friends. So that could, that's where it can be a reinforcing loop. If we make a friends with one person and they've already got some friends, then we may greatly expand our friendship group. Um, but we also may lose some friends and let's say we lose one friend a week and then we can see what happens with our little model. And here we see in our model, we have a general increase in the number of friends. But if we look at the different possibilities, we can see that if we had start with two friends and we add one friend a week and we don't lose any friends, then we'll just get a gradual increase in the number of friends. If we start with two friends and if we make um, new friends and they have friends, then we'll see a much more rapid increase in the number of friends. But eventually we'll plateau because we'll have made friends with everyone in the class. But if we have, if we start with five friends and we add one friend a week and we lose one friend a week, 
will continuously stay at five frames. It'll stay constant. And if we start with 10 friends and we lose one friend or add one friend a week, but lose two friends, we'll eventually end up with no friends. So these are all different ways of exploring um, this through looking at different loops and going through and exploring the various consequences of those loops. And here I am stuck in a loop. There we are. And we can then look at them in terms of our stock flow diagrams and how the overall stock flow diagram can be built up by looking at all the various interacting factors that we've considered in our story. Now, the story doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be able to help us tell a story. And there's a number of other stories we could tell. These are ones like the number of pencils in your classroom and why they keep disappearing, the number of trees that are outside, the grass, the various other connections that we can explore. And these are done with young children. So have a look at that as a simulation. And explain um, your own perspectives on the friendship model into teams. So how does that work in terms of your own experiences with friendships and friendship groups or any social group networking processes? <coughs> now, the next one we're going to look at is used to explore concepts involved in a pandemic. Um, with the number of people being infected and recovering and, and so forth. And there are various simulations we can use to explore that. A very simple level one, we have a reinforcing and a balancing loop, reinforcing where the number of people who get sick increases the number of people who get, number of people who are sick. Um, and that in, um, reinforces itself. But we also eventually get number of people who are not sick. So here, in terms of a stock flow diagram, we see that again, we have two stocks, the number of healthy people and the number of sick people. And we have a certain flow value, which is the chance of people becoming sick. Um, but that also can be affected by if there's more healthy people um, coming into contact with sick people, that can increase the rate of flow of people going from healthy to people going to sick. But likewise, the more sick people there are can also increase the number of people going from healthy to sick. Um, but eventually, there's also a number of sick people get better, which increases the number of healthy people again. So let's have a look at this particular simulation. So in this case, we again have some decisions about the total population, the number of people. Um, so let's say if we were doing it in a school, we might have a population of, say, 100 students and staff. Um, so we can set down the total number of people. Let's say we're doing it for a classroom. Let's say 30 people. Um, how often they come into contact with one another. So how often do these children come into contact with one another? Let's say twice every lesson. And then we have the chance of it spreading. Is it hard to spread or easy to spread? And let's put it somewhere in the middle. Then we can see what happens with our little simulation. If we run that, we can see that fairly quickly, everyone in the class is going to be infected. Um, and we can try that with different then models. So if we decide to... Um, have people come into contact more often? Let's say if they were wearing masks or not wearing masks, how that might affect the model. So if they were wearing masks, it would be the red line. If they were not wearing masks, it might be the purple line. Um, and then we can just try out different ideas. 
And these can then be put into a connection, um, our um, stock flow diagrams. So this is a very simple model. But now let's look at a more complex model. <coughs> now, unfortunately, this one doesn't take us into um, looking at the stock flow, di stock flow diagrams as much but it does allow us to see how the model can be used in other ways. Okay, so in this model, if we do nothing, um, and we have various settings we can set, like how long we go into quarantine for, um, the quarantine duration, um, how effective the quarantine is, the amount of contact tracing, the symptomatic test rating, how, how, quick, how often we're testing people with symptom, symptoms, and our capacity to test, um, all of which we would have seen uh, played out in the recent pandemic. But we can adjust those various factors and then run the simulation and see the number of healthy people um, decrease, the number of infected people increase, uh, unfortunately, the number of dead people that may result, and the number of recovered. So, and in the teal again, we can see the number of those that never was infected and didn't die. <laughs> but we can adjust that then with different um, aspects. So let's say we increase the quarantine. So we have a much longer quarantine and we run that. And we can then see the effect is not that great. <laughs> so we would adjust different um, factors and try different ideas. Um, there are other different approaches that can be done to look at other um, mechanisms as well. But the idea is that we can use our system model to explore real world situations and problems. Now, of course, you're going to be using it to explore what happens in your organization as a result of the introduction of an educational technology. These models were looking at um, a pandemic, um, but the models themselves are actually quite a bit simpler than the model you're going to be using for your particular study. Okay, so, so we've looked at the um, pandemic interaction and Again, share onto Teams your own story about the use of um, simulation models in various circumstances. So can you suggest some elaborations to the pandemic model, for example, based on your own experiences that might improve that model? What aspects didn't it include? Were there some other um, elements may have been different choices of vaccines, for example, and effectiveness of different vaccines. That wasn't really built into that model. Mostly, of course, it was developed before the um, vaccines became available. So there were other things that the model didn't incorporate that would have been useful in exploring various aspects. And then how might that modeling be used to tell stories, maybe to convince people about the effectiveness of wearing masks or social distancing? or having vaccines. Um, so that's the idea of where we can utilize models for storytelling, to get across ideas, taking our research through the use of models and making it applicable to others in a more generalized way. Now, the final um, storytelling model we want to look at is um, the use of, of guns and the impact of guns um, in particularly in the United States, but we can use this to explore how data and modeling can address other social issues. So let's have a look at this one. <laughs> so in this model, we'll build out our model of um accessibility of guns so here people being killed in schools by guns is the first sort of flow 
and we have various stocks then, which is the cumulative number of deaths from shootings in schools. Um, and that can be impacted on by various factors, which are difficult to read in here, but this factor is the average number of people killed per shootings incidents per year. So for each incident, how, num how many people are killed? Rather grisly, um, but in Australia, we don't face this issue as much, but certainly in some countries, uh, most notably the United States, it is a significant issue. So there we also have the number of students that have access to guns. Um, the population of people that are um, providing students with access to guns based upon the total number of guns available in the society. Um, and then there's also the, the reasons why students would resort to using guns. And this is taken into a stock of the level of rage of students. So how upset they are about certain things that would cause them to um, use guns to try to solve their problems. And there's also the impact of media um, publicizing shootings, which may influence um, others to copycat um, such things and so forth. So I'll just skip through a few more steps. And so it builds up a more complex model, um, in particular looking at the um, humiliation of some students or the reasons why they may resort to such actions. Remembering systems modeling is designed to help broaden our understanding of what's occurring. So it's not just looking at the availability of, of guns, but also about why students might use guns um, in a school setting and how all of these different factors can interrelate. Um, so again, just one more model that allows us to tell various stories that try to explain various concepts. And in this case, it's trying to argue for building in a, um, a mechanism to try to dissipate students' rage levels so they don't get to a point whereby they resort to um, the use of violence in schools, uh, particularly through the use of guns. So it's a particular perspective on gun violence. It may not be the perspective everyone takes in researching gun violence and looking at that. Um, others might look at uh, the use of lockdown drills and arming teachers and having students wear bulletproof vests or bulletproof backpacks and other mechanisms that are being put in place to ad address these issues. And they made it, might explore those in a model that they were developing and may generate very different stories about how to address the issue. Um, so systems modeling won't always lead to the same story, won't always lead to the same model. There'll be various choices made by the researchers along the way to build the model and then how the model is actually played out, how different variables are put into place in the model, um, will also tell different stories. So again, system modeling is used as a way of exploring issues, but it's still subject to interpretation and a process of research where we utilize systems models to assist us in understanding what's occurring. But any model will be imperfect and we need to accept that. Um, but it still is much better than just going in with assertions that are unsupported. We can at least build some framework that can justify why we believe things may happen as we suspect they may. So in tutorial, come along prepared to discuss your system model and about how you're building it and the various assumptions and structures that you're putting into place to frame your understanding of what occurs in your organization and the stories that you're going to be able to tell 
that will support your transformation plan. That's it for this week. And I look forward to seeing you in the tutorial.